Just take a look. It's in a book called Reading Rainbow. Oh, boom. Here we are. So good to see every single one of you. Welcome to the JB Font channel. It's so good to see you on this beautiful day. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So the JB Font channel is available on all major podcast platforms like Anchor, Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. So you can subscribe to me there. I'm also part of the, part of the Revolutionary Blackout Network. So you can watch us and me on Sundays at 1 p.m. on RBN as well as RBN Live on Tuesdays at 4 and the Savvy and JB Show on Thursdays at 6. Please give this recording a thumbs up. Yes, that is right. I am doing a reading. And thank you to everyone who is subscribed, as well as to everyone who is also a patron of Patreon, Coffee, those of you who are also members as well as anybody who sends me mutual aid, you know, and any of the various platforms. Without you guys, I would not be able to do this. And I am deeply grateful from the top and bottom of my heart. So, hmm, we have been waiting and you guys have been very patient and I'm doing the reading of Asada. The autobiography. We're covering now chapter two. So chapter two, we're getting into it. We're going to go to Asada's young life. So this is what we're going to be covering. Um, this is, you know, very interesting. She actually made me laugh a couple times. She, she took me back to my childhood a little bit, you know. So uh, back in the 80s and early 90s, you know, so. A lot of the same stuff that was said back then was some of the stuff that was said, especially when I was a kid. And I still hear it even down to this day. So it's going to be interesting to get into, really, um, especially from my perspective, you know, as a you know black man's perspective. Um, I'll only be a young black man <laughs> for two for two and a half, well, a year and a half. Then after that, I'll be middle age. But. This is actually really interesting, and I'm actually quite keen to get into this. And um, there's a lot of, you know, um, of her history is being told here. But I hope you guys enjoy it. This is going to be a, a lengthy one, so I just wanna, really want to make sure I get into this. But um, also, you know, if you have, you know, once I get into certain parts, let me know what you think, especially about um, how the sayings that black people have if you've heard that in your life i don't care if you're not black if you heard it then you heard it but also put that down in the comments if you heard that before too you know <laughs> like slap the black off you <laughs> sorry i don't want to give it away but there's some good stuff there's some good ones in here anyway so we're going to get into it. I don't have tea right now because I just had a smoothie, a, a fruit and vegetable smoothie. So I'm like, yeah, I, I'm. I think I'm all right for the most part. But oh, I thought my phone was ringing. Anyway, let's get into it. Chapter two. The FBI cannot find any evidence that I was born. On oh, my FBI wanted poster. A list of they list my birthday as July 16th, 1947, and in parentheses, not substantiated by birth records. Anyway, I was born. I'm the older of two children. My sister, Beverly, was born five years later. The name my mama gave me was Joanne Deborah Byron. I am told that I was a fat, happy baby and that I was talking in complete sentences when I was about nine months old. That's pretty young. They say that I was lazy though, that I walked way before I could, before I learned to walk. I talked way before I learned to walk. Everybody says that I had my days mixed up with my nights and kept everybody up all night. 
I'm still pretty much a night owl. The only other tale I remember hearing about my babyhood was that I would scream at the top of my lungs whenever anybody wears furs or feathers, anybody wearing furs or feathers came near me. I'm still not too fond of fur, furs and feathers. My mother and father were divorced shortly after I was born. I lived with my mother, my aunt, now Evelyn Williams, my grandmother, Lulu Hill, and my grandfather, Frank Hill, in a house in the Bricktown section of Jamaica, New York. The only thing I remember about the house is the backyard, which I loved, and a huge dog next door. I remember the dog well because he terrified me. To my young eyes, he looked like a giant, a canine version of King Kong or Mighty Joe Young. I'm still not too wild about dogs. When I was three years old, my grandparents sold the house and moved down south. I moved with them. We moved into a big wooden house in 7th Street in Wilmington, North Carolina. It was the house my grandfather had grown up in. It had a wraparound porch and a big green swing. And of course, rose bushes in the front yard and a pecan tree in the back. My grandfather originally thought that the house had belonged to my great grandfather, Papa Link, short for Lincoln. But they found out he had only been given the use of the house for his lifetime. Papa Link had worked as a chauffeur for one of the most prominent white families in Wilmington, and as the story goes, has been a prominent member of the black community. He and my great grandmother, Mama Jessie, had worked hard all their lives, had raised 11 children in that house, and had died under the impression that the house was theirs. Fine print and white lawyers have a way of robbing black people of what is theirs. My grandparents were forced to buy the house again. That hit home because something happened with my grandmother a couple years ago where she actually lost her house and she owned it for over 50 years. This is not where she didn't own it, but she found out she, no, no, she legit owned the house, but somebody came from under and took it, took it away. So, yeah. So yeah, that kind of hit home. So the, the home that me and my family were supposed to inherit, it's gone. My mom is in her 70s, never owned a home in her life. And guess what? She never will. Because she can't afford a home, I can't afford a home. And the home that we were supposed to inherit is now gone. I tell you, that's how it goes. Who's better than you? Nobody. Who? Nobody. Get that head up. Yes. Yes, who? Yes, grandmommy. I want that head up hell high. And I don't want you taking no mess from anybody. You understand? Yes, grandmommy. Don't you let me hear about anybody walking over my grandbaby. No, grandmommy. I don't want nobody taking advantage of you. You hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes, who? Yes, grandmommy. All of my family tried to instill in me a sense of personal dignity, but my grandmother and my grandfather were really fanatic about it. Over and over they would tell me, you're as good as anybody else. Don't let anybody tell you that they're better than you. My grandparents strictly forbade me to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, or to look at my shoes or to make subservient gestures when talking to white people. You look at them in the eye and you talk to them, I was told, and speak up like you got some sense. And I was told to speak in a loud, clear voice and to hold my head up high or risk having my grandparents knock it off my shoulders. My grandparents were big on respect. I was to be polite and respectful to adults, to say good morning or good evening as I passed the neighbor's houses. Any kind of back talk or sass was simply out of the question. My grandparents didn't even permit me to answer questions with a simple yes or no. Instead, I had to say, yes, grandmother, or no, grandfather. 
But when it came to dealing with white people in the segregated South, my grandmother would tell me menacingly, don't you respect nobody that don't respect you, you hear me? Yes, grandmother, I would answer, my voice almost in a whisper, speak up. She would tell me repeatedly something that she seemed hell-bent on making me do. She would send me to the store with clear instructions on what to bring back. I was under no circumstances to come home with inferior goods, something which happened all too often to black people in the South. You tell them that you don't want, want any garbage and you better not come back with any, she would warn me. If the stone Arnold told me something that my grip sold me something that my grandmother didn't like, I would have to return to the store and get the thing changed or get my money back. You speak up loud and clear. Don't let me have to go down to that store. Scared to death of the fuss my grandmother would make if she had to go down to the store herself. I would hurry back to the store, prepared to raise almighty hell. Okay. That reminds me of my mother. God forbid something doesn't go the way it's supposed to. And then if I don't speak up and my mother finds out, look, one time I was in the hospital and I was waiting to go back and my mother was like, you haven't been taken back yet? Let me talk to him. Gosh, it reminds me of my mama. Lord, Lord. Whew, can't tell her nothing. Next thing you know, what the hell? This is why people think of Medea when they look at my mama. Anyway. Whenever my grandmother heard about somebody being mistreated, this is my mama too, especially if it was a man mistreating a woman, she would glare at me and say, don't let, don't you let anybody mistreat you, treat you, you hear? We're not raising you up to be mistreated, you hear? I don't want you taking no mess off nobody, you understand? Yes, grandmother, I would answer. Always seemed like the millionth time, wondering why my grandmother liked to repeat herself so often. The tactics that my grandparents used were crude, and I hated when they would repeat everything so often. But the lessons that ta they taught me, more than anything else I learned in life, helped me to deal with the things I would face growing up in America. But a lot of times for my grandparents, pride and dignity were hooked up to things like position and money. For them, being just as good as white people meant having what white people had. They would tell me to go to school and study so I can have a nice house and nice clothes and a nice car. White people don't want to see us with nothing, they would tell me. That's why you gotta get your education so that you can be somebody and have something in life. Becoming somebody in life just didn't mean much to me. I wanted to feel happy, to feel good. My awareness of class differences in the black community came at an early age. Although my grandmother taught me more about being proud and strong than anyone I know. Sorry, although my grandmother taught me more about being proud and strong than anyone I know, she had a lot of Booker T. Washington pull yourself up by the bootstraps talented 10th ideas. She had worked hard and had made a decent living as a peace worker in a factory, but she had other ideas for me. She was determined that I would become part of Wilmington's talented 10th, the privileged class, a part of the so-called black bourgeoisie. So she basically wanted her to be like the Tyler Perry's, the Open Winfrey's, the, uh, the Byron Allens wanted her to be basically, you know, the super affluent, you know, rich blacks. Because that's what she thought that it would be. That's what she thought making it was. That was one part that she was mistaken. Now we see now today. But. Of course, that was the mentality back then for some black people. One of her first steps was to sternly forbid me to play with alley rats. 
It was impossible for me to obey her orders since I had absolutely no idea what an alley rat was. I often became the unwitting object of my grandmother's fury, charged with crime of an alley rat playing, crime with the crime of alley rat playing. My grandmother, wreathing with air of annoyance, would threaten me with untold punishments if I continued my evil ways. I received strict orders to abandon my penchant for alley rats and to play with decent children, but we would never agree on who decent children were. Decent children to my grandmother were a whole nother story. Decent children came from decent families. How did you know what a decent family was? A decent family lived in a decent house. How did you know what a decent house was? A decent house was fixed up nice and had a sidewalk in front of it. Decent families didn't let their kids play in the street with no shoes on and didn't let their kids say ain't. Little did my grandmother know that ain't was my favorite word since I got two feet out of her hearing range. My grandmother, <laughs> my grandmother had a little alley rat right under her roof and she didn't even know who it was. Alley rats supposedly lived in alleys and run down shacks. My grandmother would often call one of my friends an alley rat, even if the kid didn't live in an alley. All right, so. Ain't and finnin or finna, <laughs> we could not. We could not in my family. That was hilarious. So see, everything she's telling me is just taking me back. It's just like, Especially a lot of us who are from up north, you know, even if you sounded country, if you had a twang or if you said, had a country accent, that was like, what? What are you talking about? Mm -mm. No, 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 no. You speak proper English. Yep. Get an education. That was my family. Mm -hmm. Go to college. Yep. <laughs> that was my family. Even, even, you know, gosh, it's like, yeah, we had to be better than, you know, what white people assumed of us, because if not, then, you know, we wouldn't do better in life than our parents. And that's what our parents wanted for us and our grandparents. Dutifully, to put some sense in my head, she would take me to visit decent children. These decent little souls were invariably the offspring of Wilmington's black doctors, lawyers, preachers, and undertakers. School teachers, barbershop owners, and the editor of the colored newspaper were also decent. And most of these decent little play sessions, the other kids and I would stand around looking at each other awkwardly. Sometimes we would get on and have some fun. But more often than not, it would be a glare at each other time or show and tell time. These kids showing me their toys and such while grownups oohed and odd. The worst times were eating at the preacher's house where they would take an hour saying grace. Lord, I know about that. Or playing ball with the undertaker's daughter. She always wanted to play ball and I was scared to death that the ball was going to roll into the park where they kept the, the dead people. <laughs> they kept the dead people and end up in the mouth of some corpse. <laughs> My grandmother would have caught a shit fit if she had known that one of her favorite little decent kids favorite a game was playing show and tell with his dingling and threatening to pee on everybody. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yo, that's living in the hood. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, this is funny. After these visits, my grandmother would chirp for a week about how nice my little decent friends were and about how nicely we had played together while I would groan silently and keep the expression on my face one shade away from insolence. My grandmother and I waged a standoff da battle damn near until I was grown. It wasn't that I wasn't, I'm sorry, it wasn't that I wanted to defy her. It was just that I liked who I liked. 
I didn't care what kind of house my friends had or whether or not they lived in alleys. All that matters whether I liked them. I was convinced then, and I'm still convinced, that in some things, kids have a lot more sense than adults. But to my young mind, life in Wilmington was exciting. There was always new places to go and new cousins, aunts, and uncles to meet. One of my favorite relatives was Aunt Lou. She was Mama Jessie's sister and she lived across town. She was my grandfather's only remaining relative in Wilmington. The rest have moved up north or out west. Aunt Lou had a magic house full of all kinds of flavors, textures, smells, and things. There were whole worlds in her house to explore. She would always feed me something good to eat and then let me run wild. I didn't know how, I'm sorry, I didn't know until I was grown that Aunt Lou had a son. His name was Uncle Willie and he died before I was born. Uncle Willie was something of a legend around Wilmington during the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Whenever he came to town, they say Aunt Lou would plead and moan and worry until he was far, I'm sorry, in, well, he, until he was in fa safer territory up north. They said he would tear down the colored and white only signs and break the Jim Crow laws at whim. He would go around demanding his rights and denouncing the oppression of black people. And it is logical that no one who loved him felt the least bit comfortable until he was long gone. They called him Wild Willie or that crazy Indian. He was supposedly black and Cherokee, but people called him that because of his nature. They say he had a lot of friends and that he died of natural causes. The rest of the relatives I met came from my grandmother's side. My grandmother's family lived in Seabreeze outside of Wilmington, close to Carolina Beach. Their last name was Freeman and they were famous for being high strung, quick tempered and emotional. They seldom worked for anybody choosing instead to live on the land their father had left them. They worked as farmers and fishermen and they owned small stores. I have also heard they were in the bootleg business. <laughs> There's a lot of black people in the bootleg business. My grandmother's father was a Cherokee Indian. He died when my grandmother was very young. Nobody knows too much about him, except that somehow he acquired a great deal of land and left it to his children. The land was very valuable because it, of it bordered either on the river or on the ocean. Everybody had a different theory about what my great grandfather had done to acquire it. But it was because of this land that my grandparents had moved down south. In 1950, the year we moved to Wilmington, the South was completely segregated. Black people were forbidden to go many places, and that included the beach. Sometimes they would travel all the way to South Carolina just to see the ocean. My grandparents decided to open a business on their land. It consisted of a restaurant, lockers where people can change their clothes, and an area for dancing and hanging out. The popular name for the beach was Bob City, although my grandparents insisted on calling it Freeman's Beach. Though throughout my childhood, the name Freeman had no particular significance. It was the name just like any other name. It wasn't until I was grown and began to read black history that I discovered the significance of the name. After slavery, many black people refused to use the last names of their masters. They called themselves Freemen instead. The name was also used by Africans who were free before slavery was officially abolished. But it was mainly after the abolition of chattel slavery that many black people changed their names to Freemen. After learning this, I saw my ancestors in a new light. You guys know anybody who uh, has a last name Freeman? Like Morgan Freeman? Right. Interesting, right? You think of it like I'm Morgan Freeman and this is my voice. Um, so yeah, people like like do you guys know any black people named Freeman? If you do, just mention it in the comments. You don't have to put their full name, but like no, I know a family of Freemans, or I know a black person named Freeman besides Morgan Freeman. Just put that in the chat chat. I'm sorry, not in the chat, but in the comments below. That's interesting, right? Do I know any Freemans outside of Morgan Freeman? 
No, I know a white Freeman, Martin Freeman. He's an actor. Um, he was actually in Black Panther. Uh, he was also like, and think in the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, whatever one of them. I've never seen Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, so I don't, you know. But anywho, this is tidbit of information. For me, the beach was a wonderful place, and to this day, there's no place on earth that I love more. I have never seen a beach more beautiful than it was then. For I decided to build a canal through the property of my grandparents. It's now it's just a pale shadow of what it used to be, most of it destroyed by erosion. Back then, there were majestic sand dunes covered with tall seagrass, where my cousins and I would build forts, houses, and sometimes cities. When time permitted, we spent hours hiding and making sneak attacks on one another. The sand was fine and clean, and in the beginning of summer, we could find just about every imaginable kind of seashell. When the sun got too hot, we would sit in the old blue jeep my grandfather drove and play with Philly things like paper dolls and teacups. After I learned to read, I would sit in the sun under the huge hats my grandfather always made me wear and read one book after another. Every other week, my grandfather went to the colored library on Red Cross Street, and the librarian would send 10 or so books. Hang on, sorry. 10 or so books for me to read. As soon as I finished reading them, my grandfather would go and get another batch. My imagination was vivid with fragments of pirates and the Babasi twins floating around. I would sit, or, sit looking at the ocean and think about everything. I imagine all places I had read about on this, the other side of the ocean. I wonder if I will, if I would ever see them. And of course, I daydream about all kinds of stuff. Most of it silly. But my days were not sim spent simply daydreaming. My grandparents were firm believers in work. They had worked all their lives and there was no way they were going to tolerate any lazy good for nothings around them. Every day there were chores to do and there was no playing until they were completed. I did things like putting the potato chips on the racks, putting sodas in the cooler, wiping the tables clean, etc. When customers were there, I would sell small stuff like potato chips, nabs, pickles, and pickled pig's feet. I would also set the tables and bring customers things they needed. But my main job was collecting 50 cents for parking because there was no road to our beach. The paved road ended with the white section. My grandparents had to pay for a dirt road and parking lot to be laid over the sand. Truckloads of dirt were brought and the steamroller smashed it down so that it was hard enough to drive on. This was an expensive process, so my grandparents decided to charge 50 cents for parking. I could count and make change at a very early age, so it was my job to collect the 50 cents. During the week, it wasn't too time consuming, but on the weekends, if the weather was nice, it was an all day job. Cars and buses of people came from all over North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. There were church groups, school groups, social clubs, women's clubs, Boy Scouts, and Girl Scouts. All kinds of people would come to the beach, some with little money and some that you could tell were real poor. In all the years I spent on that beach, only one or two people hassled me. Most of them treated me very kindly, just like I was their kid. The people who came to the beach fascinated me. I loved to see them come and go. After a while, I would recognize the regulars and it didn't take me long to learn their names. Some of them gave me tips, which I usually spent on the piccolo jukebox. There were lots of lovers I and I spent time I spent some of my time spying on them in the parking lot, but they weren't too interesting. All they did was squirm a lot. <laughs> oh, Lord. Checking license plates. I could recognize almost all of the state's license plates on site. And collecting bugs. I had a huge collection. Were much more uninteresting. But watching families was better. On their picnics with their fried chicken, potato salads, and watermelon. Some of them looked so happy you can tell that they didn't get a chance to go to many picnics. And I was always on the watch for kids to play with when I wasn't busy. Then there were the good timers. 
Their cars smell like whiskey. They would dance a lot, eat a lot, and spend a lot on, on the piccolo. And many times I would wonder if they had made it home all right. A lot of poor people came to the beach. Sometimes the floors of their raggedy old cars or trucks were half rotted out. Usually a lot of little children with them and they wouldn't have bathing suits. They went swimming in whatever clothes they had worn to the beach. Half the time, the little kids wore nothing. Then there are those who came to put on airs, usually in the evening, all dressed up to eat dinner. Many would say, I can't stand the sun. I'm too black already. I ain't got, I ain't going out in, in no sun. Okay. I've said that before. I don't say it anymore, but I used to say that because I'm, I'm dark skinned. So, but now, shoot, I don't care. If I get darker, darker, the better, sweeter the juice, baby. That's all it's all about. Anyway, <laughs> it was amazing the number of people who said they were too black already. We looked at them like they were crazy because we love the sun. But the umbrellas for rent went like hotcakes. Some people draped clothes and blankets around the umbrellas so that no light penetrated whatsoever. One lady always put a paper bag on her head and poked holes in it for her eyes. Some of the women refused to go near the water because they were afraid their hair would go bad. Um, so it's kind of interesting because, um, chemical relaxers were a thing back in the day. And if you guys watch, uh, Savvy stream, latest stream, she actually talked about how L'Oreal uh, is being sued right now for their chemical relaxers because they're now causing different types of cancer. Um, go ahead and check, check her stream out about that. But, um, a lot of women would use chemical, black women would use chemical relaxers and things like that to straighten it because black hair was seen as, um, black hair was seen as, you know, bad because, you know, Euros, Eurocentric um, beauty standards. And so if you got your hair wet, it would ruin it, you know, or if they used a hot comb, they get that, they get that, that lard and that hot comb. Straighten it out. Once it got wet, curl right back up. So they didn't want to get their hair wet. So yeah, that was the thing back then. One of the moving things for me was when someone saw the ocean for the first time. It was amazing to watch. They would stand there in awe, overpowered and overwhelmed, as if they as if they had come face to face with God or with the vastness of the universe. I remember one time a preacher brought an old lady to the beach. She was one of the oldest looking person I had ever seen. She said that she just wanted to see the ocean before she died. She stood there in one spot for so long she looked like she was in a trance. Then, with the help of the preacher, she hobbled around, picked up the mundane shells, and put them into her handkerchief as if, as if they were the most precious things in the world. That's beautiful. I love to eat, still do. Hey man, me too. And the beach was right up my alley. Right now, I still think of the fried chicken and fish dinners. My mouth starts to want water. But what really sends me off is remembering those seafood platters with fish, shrimps, oysters, devil crab, clam fritters, and french fries with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. If my memory is any good, I think they sold for a dollar fifty. Lord, and Lord, if I had a meal like that for a dollar fifty, oh my God, golly, that's easy. That's easy, like a twenty-five, twenty-six dollar dinner right now these days. Wow. Next to food, music was my love. Fats Domino, Nat King Cole, Chuck Berry, Little, Little Richard, The Platters, Brooke Benson, Bobby Blue Bland, James Brown, Dinah Washington, Maxine Brown, Big Maybell were some of the people I listened to during those beach years. I loved to dance. They would play that music and I would dance my natural heart out. That was another way I collected tips. People would egg me on. Go on, gal, go. 
Boy, look at that girl dance. Look at that little girl dance. But I love to see people dance too. Many a time my grandmother or grandfather had to call me out of the trance. I was watching somebody dance instead of doing my chores. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love choreography. I love watching people dance too. I think it's the most coolest thing. Choreography is something I love watching. Like those dance shows, I love them for the most part. Especially like the hip hop dances, the you know, the break dancing competitions. Oh, those are my favorite. At night, my cousins who sometimes came over to work on the beach told ghost stories. They loved to tell them to me because I would get scared out of my wits. And they would tell me about people who came back from the dead, about snakes that could crawl up at 100 miles an hour and beat you to death with their tails and about red phantoms and haints and all kinds of other horrible, other horrible things. My imagination was vivid and before the night was over, the seagrass turned to monsters and the wind made ghost howls. Sometimes even my grandmother and grandfather would get into the ghost story sessions. My grandfather's favorite one goes like this. He was driving home in a terrible storm one night it was lightning and thundering like crazy. He saw lightning hit a tree ahead of him, and he saw the tree fall across the road. He tried to stop, but it was too late. He braced himself to hit the tree, but nothing happened. The car went smoothly as if it weren't there. He turned around, and sure enough, the tree was still lying across the road. He swears that story is true, and I'm convinced that he thoroughly believes that it is. We were, however, visited by real live ghosts. They were the phantoms of the parking lot. It seems that the white citizens of white citizens of Wilmington and Carolina Beach were not at all happy that my grandparents had dared to build on the land and to start a colored business. We were too close for their comfort. So they would visit us from time to time and express their disapproval. I don't know for a fact that they were card carrying members of the clan, but judging from their behavior, I think they were. But then, of course, they weren't wearing it, their sheets. They could have just been red blooded American boys out for some good, clean fun. The parking lot was made of dirt and the car spinning around on it at breakneck speed would ruin it in no time. Two or three of them would ride around the parking lot, spinning, skidding, while they shouted at curses and racist insults. One time they fired their guns in the air. I remember seeing them and hearing them out there and wondering what are they going to do next? More than once I saw my grandfather go to where he kept his gun and carried it quietly to where he had been sitting. Somehow this made me more afraid because I knew that he too thought they were scary. Finally, my grandfather put a big fat chain, almost as big as the kind used to anchor ships across the road at the entrance to the parking lot. This soon eliminated our nightly visitors. One night, as my grandfather and I were fastening the chain in place and locking it, a white man drove up to the lot and in an arrogant tone of voice, ordered my grandmother to open the gate so that he could turn his car around. My grandmother, looking very dignified, said, no, I can't let you do that. Then in a nicer voice, he asked my grandmother again to open the gate. No, she said again. Come on now, auntie, I got a mammy in my house. Now open the gate and let me turn around. What you say? Asked my grandmother. I said, I got a mammy in my house. Now come on, open up. My grandmother leaned over the man face. I don't care how many mammies you got in your house. I don't care if you got a hundred mammies in your house. You're going to back out of here tonight and I want you off my property now, right now. That man turned as red as a redneck can turn and started to back his car up. The road was very narrow, barely wide enough for one car and there was no way he could turn around without getting stuck in the sand. He backed up for more than a quarter of a mile. As we looked at him backing up, my mother and I laughed so hard that tears fell from our faces. Every day when we drove from the house on 7th Street to the beach, we passed a beautiful park with a zoo. 
And every day I would beg and plead, whine and nag my grandmother to take me to the zoo. It was almost an obsession. She would always say that one day she would take me, but one day never came. I would sit in the car pouting, thinking how mean she was. I thought that she had to be the meanest woman on the face of the earth. Finally, with the strangest look on her face, she told me that we were not allowed in the zoo because we were black. When we were on the beach, we shopped at Carolina Beach. It had an amusement park, but of course, black people were not permitted to go in. Every time we passed it, I looked at the merry-go-round and the Ferris wheel and the little cars and airplanes, and my heart would just long to ride them. My favorite forbidden ride had little boats and a pool of water. And every time I passed them, I felt frustrated and deprived. Of course, persistent creature that I am, I always asked to be taken on the rides, knowing full well that the answer what the answer would be. One summer, my mother and sister and I were walking down the boardwalk. My mother was spending part of her summer helping my grandparents and the business. As soon as we near, neared the rides, I went into my usual act. I continued ad nauseum until my mother grinning said, all right now, I'm gonna try to get us in. We get over there. I don't want to hear, any word, hear one word out of either of you. Just let me do the talking. And if they ask you anything, don't answer, okay? Okay? Okay, this is gonna be funny. My mother went over to the ticket booth and began talking. I didn't understand a word she was saying. The lady at the ticket window kept telling my mother that she couldn't sell her any tickets. My mother kept talking very fast and waving her hands. The manager came over and told my mother that she couldn't buy any tickets and that we couldn't go into the park. My mother kept talking and waving her hands and soon she was screaming this foreign language. I didn't know if she was, was she was speaking a play language or a real one. Several other men came over. They talked to my mother. She continued. After the men went to one side and had a conference, they returned and told the ticket seller to give my mother the tickets. I couldn't believe it. All at once that we were laughing and giggling and riding the rides. All the white people were staring at us, but we didn't care. We were busy having a ball. When I got into one of those little boats, my mother practically had to drag me out. It was, I was in my glory. When we finished the rides, we went to the Dairy Queen for ice cream. We sang and laughed all the way home. When we got home, my mother explained that she had been speaking Spanish and told the managers that she was from a Spanish country and that if they didn't let us in, she would call the embassy in the United Nations and I didn't know who all, who all else. We laughed and talked about it for days, but it was a lesson I never forgot. Anybody, no matter who they were, could come off right off the boat and get more rights and respect than American born blacks. <sighs> that's a hard thing. That's a conversation that happens a lot with black people. A lot. I mean, I've heard it in my family. I've heard it in many black families. And they'll look at immigrants and they will express resentment. And they'll be like, we can't barely get any help, but people who come here, they get all these programs. And that's the way a lot of black people feel. They feel like, you know, and this is some black people, you know, they feel like they can have more opportunities than those of us who were born here, you know, and it's sad. And it may not be as tr that true. It may be, you know, just our perception, but that's what it seems like. And so, but really it's the exploitation. And, you know, we start to learn that. 
But yeah, that's a conversation that happens a lot in the black community. My first school experience was Miss Perkins School, Mrs. Perkins School in Wilmington. It was a little two-room school in Red Cross Street where I learned the fundamentals of reading, writing, and arithmetic. I was four years old. Mrs. Perkins School was the closest thing to a nursing school that black people in Wilmington had, but she didn't play that baby play stuff. We were there to learn. And I was prone to colds, however, and I guess the pot belly stove in the school didn't give off enough heat. I was sick more than I was in school. But I learned enough that so that when I went to first grade, everything was easy. I could already read. I spent most of the first grade in New York with my mother, the rest of the first and second grade down south with my grandparents. I went to Gregory Elementary School in Wilmington. My teachers knew my grandparents well and gave them daily reports of my progress. The teachers were strict and believed solemnly in the paddle, but we learned. Of course, our school was segregated, but the teachers took more of an interest in our lives because they lived in our world, in the same neighborhoods. They knew that we were uh, what we were up against and what we were facing as adults, and they tried to protect us as much as they could. More than once, we were punished because some children had made fun of a student who was poor and badly dressed. I'm not saying that segregation was a good system. Our schools were inferior. The books were used and torn, handed down from white schools. We received only a fraction of state money allotted to white schools and, con and the conditions under which many black children received an education can only be described as horrible. But black children encountered support and understanding and encouragement instead of the hostile indifference they often met from the integrated schools. There was a big dirt yard next to the school where we would play and fight. We grew up fighting. It was really hard to get through school without a few fights, just to survive. But I always wonder what made people fight, especially after we learned about wars. I used to look up the remains of the sunken, I used to look at look out at the remains of the sunken ship that tilted in front of the beach and wonder how people had died in it. It was covered with green moss, and I imagined skeletons floating around inside. The ship had been sunk during the Civil War. And I always wonder if it carried Northerners or Southerners. Back in those days, I used to think the Northerners were the good guys. I never could make much sense out of war. I remember being taught that World War I was a war to end all wars. Well, we know that was a lie because there was World War II. I remember a teacher telling us that World War I was started because Prince Ferdinand, somewhere in Austria, got killed. When we learned the history, we were never taught the real reasons for things. We were just taught useless trivia, simplistic facts, key phrases, and miscellaneous, meaningless things. I couldn't understand it. There were people all the way in America doing an award. I'm sorry. What were people all the way in America doing in a war because some prince got killed in Austria? I could just imagine going home and telling my grandmother I got in a fight because some dude in Europe got killed. Kind of interesting, kind of makes sense, but. They made war sound so glorious in school, so heroic. But the wars we had on the way home from school and in the playground were anything but glorious. Besides the cuts and scratches we received in the battleground, we were likely to get spanked for fighting or for getting our clothes dirty. I was pretty lucky in that respect. When my grandmother would discover that I was all in one piece, she wouldn't make too much of a fuss. I guess I looked pretty much the same after a fight as I did any other day when I came home from school. I was a natural tomboy and a natural slob. My blouse was always hanging out of my skirt. One of my socks always fell down in my shoe. and My hair always flew wild around my head. I always managed to get something torn and dirty, and because I was awkward and clumsy, I always looked like a victim of about 50 wars. Damn. Most of our fights started over petty disputes like stepped on shoes, flying spitballs, and the contested ownership of pens and pencils. But behind our fights, self-hatred was clearly visible. 
Let me know if y'all heard some of these in the comments. Okay. Nappy head, nappy head. I'll catch your ass. You're going to be dead. You think you black and ugly now? I'm going to beat you to you purple. You're just another nigga to me. I'm going to show you what I'll do with niggas like you. You better shut your big blubber lips. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. This is taking me back to my school years. <laughs> we would call each other jungle bunnies and bush boogies. <laughs> we would talk about each other's ugly big lips and flat noses. We would call each other pickaninnies and nappy haired so and so's. At your age, not your color, we would tell each other. You won't thank me when I'm through with you. I'm going to beat you so bad, I'm going to beat the black off of you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my Lord. Ooh, Lord. This is taking me back. Black made any insult worse. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> when you called somebody a bastard, that was bad. But when you called somebody a black bastard, now that was terrible. In fact, when I was growing up, being called black, period, was grounds for fighting. Who you calling black, I would say. We had never heard the words black is beautiful. And the idea never occurred to most of us. I hated for my grandmother to comb my hair and she hated to comb it. My hair was always been thick and long and nappy and it would give my grandmother hell. She had straight hair, she had straight hair. It was, so she was impatient with mine. When she combed my hair, she always remembered something I had done wrong that day or earlier that day and popped in Pop me in the head with the comb. She will always tell me during these sessions, now when you grow up, I want you to marry a man with some good hair so your children will have good hair. You hear me? Yes, grandmother. I used to wonder why she hadn't followed her own advice since my grandfather's hair was far from straight. But I never dared to ask. My grandmother just said that what everybody knew was common fact. Good hair was better than bad hair, meaning that straight hair was better than nappy hair. When my sister Beverly was little, I remember teasing her about her lips. She has big, beautiful lips. But back then, we looked at them as something of a liability. I never thought of them as ugly. My sister was always very pretty to me, but her lips were something good to tease her about. I once told her, with those big lips, the only thing you got going for you is your long hair. You better never cut that, cut it off. I would never know how much damage all my teasing did to my sister. But I was only saying what everybody knew. Little, thin lips were better than big, thick lips. Everybody knew that. There was one girl in our school whose mother made her wear a clothespin on her nose to make it thin. <clears throat> there were quite a few girls who tried to bleach their skin while bleaching with bleaching cream and who got pimples instead. And of course, we went to the beauty parlor to get our hair straightened. I couldn't wait to go to the beauty parlor to get my hair all fried up. I wanted Shirley Temple curls, just like Shirley Temple. I hated the smell of fried hair and having my ears burn. But we were taught that women had to make great sacrifices to be beautiful. And everyone knew you had to be crazy to walk the streets with nappy hair sticking out. And of course, long hair was better than short hair. We all knew that. Like I said, remember to watch that stream by Savvy where she talks about L'Oreal. About chemical straighteners. We have been completely brainwashed and we didn't even know it. We accepted white value systems and white standards of beauty. And at times, we accepted the white man's view of ourselves. We had never been exposed to any other point of view or any other standard of beauty. From when I was a tot, I can remember black people saying, niggas ain't shit. You know how lazy niggas are. Give a nigga an inch and he'll take a mile. Everybody knows what niggas like to do after they eat, sleep. Everybody knew that niggas couldn't be on time. That's why there was CPT, color people time. Oh my God, I heard all this stuff all my life. Niggas don't take care of nothing. 
niggas don't stick together. The list can go on and on. To varying degrees, we accepted these statements as true. And to varying degrees, we each made them true with ourselves because we believed them. Remember that part um, in, uh, there was a comedy special that Chris Rock did and he talked, I think it was, was it Bigger and Blacker or Never Scared? It was one of the two. But he said, he said there are two types of black people. There's black people and there's niggas. And he said, and niggas got to go. That is this. That's that's basically that, right? When you don't, when you, when you're conditioned to to look at your people with disdain, not realizing the systemic issues that have caused us to be a certain way, then you automatically look down on certain people, even if even though you're the same race. That's sad. And I used to think it too. Oh boy, I used to think it. Oh gosh. But I'm learning. I'm learning. And I'm decolonizing. I entered the third grade in PS 154 in Queens. The school was almost all white and I was the only black kid in my class. Everybody in my family was glad I was going to a school in New York. The schools are better, they said. You get a better education up north than in segregated school down south. School up north was much different for me than school down south. For one thing, the teachers, they were all white. I don't remember having any black teachers until I was in high school. And they were always grinning at me. And the older I got, the less I liked those grins. I didn't have a name for them, but now I call them little nigga grins. My third grade teacher was young, blonde, very prissy and middle class. Whenever I came to the room, she would show me all 32 of her, of her teeth. But there was nothing sincere about her smile. It never made me feel good. There was always something unnatural and exaggerated about her behavior with me. One of my first or second day in class, she was teaching us penmanship. Does anyone know how to make a capital L in script? She asked. Nobody raised a hand. Timidly I, timidly, I did. You know how to do it, she asked incredulously. Yes, I told her. We had that last year down south. Well, come and write it on the blackboard then, she told me. I wrote my pitiful little second grade L on the blackboard. After looking at me and nodding, she made a big fancy L next to mine. Is this what you're trying to make, Joanne? Her expression was smug. The whole class broke out laughing. I wanted to go somewhere and hide. After that, every time I mentioned something I learned down south, she got mad. She never saw my raised hand. When she couldn't ignore it, like no one else raised theirs, she would say something like, oh, do you know the answer, Joanne? That's pretty fucked up, I'm telling you. It's like, none of the kids knew how to write script. You know, this little black girl that actually knows how to do it, she does it. It may not be perfect. It may be kind of squiggly because, you know, she's in the second grade. She's probably about six or seven years old. And then instead of saying, yes, that's how it's done. That's how you do it. She humiliates her by just doing a big one next to her that's, more, you know, better quality because, well, she's an adult and she's been writing penmanship for years. See how, oh gosh, that pisses me off. Anyway, back to the book. Every holiday at class was assigned to put on a play. There were plays for Columbus Day. Screw Christopher Columbus, genocidal maniac. Halloween, Thanksgiving, another bad holiday, you know, indigenous people and all that. Christmas, AKA Saturnalia. Our class had George Washington's birthday, a slave owner. And our play was about his cutting down this cherry tree, a che I can't talk today, cherry tree when he was a little boy. I was selected to be in the play. I was tickled pink and so proud. I was cast to be one of the cherry trees. 
the teacher put some green crepe paper over my head and told me to stand in the back of the stage where I was to stay until the end of the play. Then the cherry trees were supposed to sway from side to side saying, George Washington never told a lie, never told a lie, he never told a lie. George Washington never told a lie and the truth goes marching on. I didn't know what a fool they had made out of me until I grew up and started to read real history. Not only was George Washington probably a big liar, but he had once sold a slave, a slave for a keg of rum. Here he had his <laughs> damn. Here they had this old crack of slave master who didn't give a damn about black people, and they had me, an unwitting little black child, doing a play in his honor. When George Washington was fighting for freedom in the Revolutionary War, he was fighting for the freedom of whites only, rich whites at that. After the so-called revolution, you couldn't vote unless you were a white man and you owned a plot of land. The Revolutionary War was led by some rich white boys who got tired of paying heavy taxes to the king. It didn't have anything to do with freedom, justice, and equality for all. Hang on, doesn't that kind of sound like today? Think about it. A bunch of rich people who don't want to pay taxes, and they're the ones who have all the freedom. Think about all the billionaires. There's, I think there's only like seven like black billionaires. The rest of the billionaires are all white. And they just don't want to pay taxes, and they have the most freedom. Isn't that interesting? What really has changed since the Revolutionary War? Anyway, again, in the fourth grade, I was the only black kid in my class. My teacher, Mr. Trubowitz, was cool, he was cool though, and a very good teacher. He had modern ideas about teaching, and instead of making us read those old, boring readers, he had us read real books and write reports about them. His class was always interesting. He told us all kinds of jokes and stories, and he seemed to be sincerely concerned about us. That year, we were learning about the Civil War and about Lincoln's freeing of the slaves. Like all other teachers, Mr. Trubowitz taught us fairy tale history, but at least he made it interesting. That year, I was crazy about Lincoln. I memorized the entire Oh, Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman and, and recited it to, to the class. Little did I know that Lincoln was an arch racist who had openly expressed his disdain for black people. He was of the opinion that black people should be forcibly deported to Africa or anywhere else. We have been taught that the Civil War was fought to free the slaves, and it was not until I was in college that I learned that the Civil War was fought for economic reasons. The fact that official slavery was abolished was only incidental. Northern industrialists were fighting to control the economy. Before the Civil War, the Northern industrial economy was largely dependent on Southern cotton. The slave economy of the South was a threat to the Northern capitalism. What if the slaveholders of the South decided to set up factories and process the cotton themselves? Northern capitalists could not possibly compete with slave labor and their capitalist economy would be destroyed. To ensure that this didn't happen, the North went to war. So it sounds like the Civil War and the freeing of my ancestors as a slave was really just a byproduct. Oh, this book is juicy. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Ooh, let's go. When I was still in the fourth grade, I fell off a swing and broke my leg. Mr. Troublewitz came to my house and gave me lessons and assignments. When I returned to school, Mr. Troublewitz had left to teach in college. Everybody in the class was sad. <laughs> she has a colorful way with words. A bird beak stick to the book, teach by note, 
sorry, teach by rote. Teacher replaced him. She made us go back to reading in the readers and change the desk around so that once again, we were sitting, sitting in rows. I didn't like her and she bored me to death. One time in our class had a dance. It was a big event for me since I loved to dance. The white kids couldn't dance for nothing. They looked like a bunch of drunken kangaroos hopping all over the place, out of time with the music. I sat there with my hand over my mouth trying to suppress my laughter. I ached to get out there and show them how to do it, but nobody asked me to dance. I don't think it ever occurred to them. And if it did, they knew better. Dancing with a nigger was surely good for a week or so of teasing, but these whites were not at all out in the open with their racism. It was undercover, like their parents' racism. Anyhow, I just sat there looking at them flop around until this one kid, I'll never forget his name, Richard Kennedy. He was a poor Irish kid with red hair, came over to where I was sitting and said, if you give me a dime, I'll dance with you. The sad part of the story is that I almost gave him the dime. I wonder if he's related to Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. I wonder if he's in the same family. Interesting, right? Hmm. Anywho, because wasn't Kennedy Irish? I think all Kennedys are basically Irish. For the most part. In the fifth grade, I was put into class. I was put into the class of the school's most notorious battle axe, Mrs. Hoffler. I knew from the first day it was going to be a long, hot year. The only good thing that there was that there was another black kid in the class. The teacher put us in the back next to each other. His name was David something, but I called him David Pecan. The teacher was one of those military types and our classes resemble boot camp, where we were told to sit, how to sit, and what kind of notebooks, pencils, pens, etc. to use. She permitted no talking and gave tons of homework. Her punishment for everything was extra homework. It reminds me of Miss Crumbs when I was in uh, middle school. Whenever somebody got caught talking or doing anything she disapproved of, she gave extra homework. When you didn't have your homework, she gave extra homework. And every time she gave her extra homework, she wrote your name on the chalkboard and refused to move, remove it until you had turned in the punishment. By the time I left her class, my name covered practically the entire chalk blackboard. David and I were her favorite targets. The whole class would be in an uproar, but we were the only ones she saw with our mouths open. The more she wrote our backs, the more rebellious I became. I would sit in the back of the class and make jokes about her. One day we were talking and giggling, and she came up and pulled David out of his seat by the ear, twisting it until the whole side of his face was red and contorted with pain. I made up my mind right then that she wasn't going to do it to me. A few days later, she came after me. She put her hands on me. I kicked or I kicked her or hit her. I don't remember which. Anyway, the next thing I knew, I was in the principal's office being sent home with a note. I was scared to death my mother would find out, so I signed the note myself and brought it to school the next day. My signature didn't fool in anybody. To take a long <laughs> to make a long story short, when my mother found out, I confessed everything and told her about Mrs. Hoffler. I think she had some idea of what was going on because she had been she had seen a change in me. I had always been quiet and obedient in school. My mother went to the school, talked to the teacher and the principal, and demanded I be moved to another class. It's a good thing she wasn't one of those parents who believed the teacher is always right because I didn't know what would have happened. I guess the fact that she's a teacher and acutely aware of the racism and hostility that black children are exposed to from time to time, they entered the school had something the entered school had something to do with it. I don't remember the name of my other fifth grade teacher, except that it was a mile long and it began with a Z. But she was very nice and a very good teacher. 
she introduced us to art, literature, and philosophy. I remember studying French Revolution in her class. She made up names like Marie Antoinette, Charlotte Corday, and Rob Spierre come alive. She talked about philosophers like Rousseau, who influenced the thinking of the period and how the French Revolution was influenced by American Revolution. She even showed us pictures of the art and architecture of the period. She was the first teacher of one of very few who taught subjects as if they related to each other. Before I was in her class, I would never have imagined that history was connected to art, that philosophy was connected to science and so on. The usual way that people are taught is to think in America is that each subject is a little compartment and has no relation to any other subject. Yeah, that's how it felt like for me. For the most part, we receive fragments of unrelated knowledge and our education follows no logical format or pattern. It is exactly this kind of education that produces people who don't have the ability to think for themselves and who are easily manipulated. That's a great point because a lot of education now these days it's more about um, compliance, you know, than anything else. I think I'm going to stop here because we're an hour in and I don't want to make this too long. So I'm going to do another reading um, and I'll be doing, uh, we're stopping on page 35. And then we'll continue from page 35 to the end of chapter two because this chapter is a little long. But, yeah, so we're going to start on page, the end of page 35 and then continue to, to the end of chapter two. Chapter two ends on page 43. So what do you think? There's a lot, you know, there's definitely going to be more. I mean, I read the whole chapter already, but I, I, you know, I just wanted to, you know, not make it extremely long because if I continue to read chapter two this this you know video will be two hours long and uh, yeah but it just goes to show how much goes into your youth when you're growing up um, it kind of reminds me of when I was in middle school I think I was in seventh or eighth grade and it's funny, I went to a predominantly black school. Um, There's a predominantly black and Latino school here in Orlando. And I remember, you know, sometimes I would, you know, review things, you know, that I learned and I would talk it out loud. And I remember this white girl, I forgot her name. I think it started with a B, Bonnie or something like that. She was a young white girl freckles, brown hair. It was more like a, probably like a, a Auburn, uh, kind of shoulder length. And I remember we were, we had kind of an environmental class. Okay, so the school had a greenhouse and they would teach us some planting and horticulture in the greenhouse. And so I remember being there and I was talking about these things. And she goes, why do you always have to feel like you have to show your knowledge? And I was like, what do you mean? You always feel like you have to show your knowledge to people. And I was just talking about these things because I thought it was interesting. I didn't, I wasn't trying to show anybody up. I wasn't trying to make people feel inferior, but kind of makes me think that it's like, I don't know. Maybe she was embarrassed. I don't know. Was she embarrassed that she didn't know these things or was she angry that I was talking about these things? I don't know. I don't know. But it was just interesting that, you know, she jumped on me about talking 
about things I learned and that she felt it was a threat to her. Hmm. Huh. Anyway, it just, it just reminded me of that. I think her name was Bonnie. I think. Um, but anyway, so that's, you know, I mean, I, I was, you know, coming up in the, you know, in the early, I'm sorry, in the late eighties, early nineties, you know, in school. So actually I spent the entire 90, 1990s in, in, in school. So yeah, I didn't graduate till 2002, but very interesting how a lot of similarities overlap between when she was growing up and I was growing up. And people still say, I slap the black off you now. These days, people still say it. It's still funny, but yeah. So yeah, um, I will be getting to Dirty Truths by Michael Parenti, continuing the reading of that. I still have more to go. And this is exciting, and I'm glad to be reading this to know more about her history and you know how things were, especially in the '50s and you know coming up. So, but uh, did you guys subscribe? You know, because I do more of these readings. I don't know why, but my reading has been kind of off lately. But for some reason, I think it's the way they word things and it's kind of like not my way of speaking. For some reason, I think, I don't know what it is, but I tend to read Michael Parenti's book better. I don't know why, but I don't know. Anywho, but I'll get used to it and I'll do a little bit better next time. But this was, this was great. See you guys on Tuesday. Uh, water your plants, water yourselves, leave the world better than you found it. Reading is fundamental. And drink some water, y'all. It's good for you.